So for example, in identifying the model that you're interested in using, you're going to talk about all of this in 5.18. Or they invent, I just noticed somebody, uh, another person in the econ program sent me an email today in the spring that teaching sounds like a new first, uh, a new one semester time series class. Instead of 5.18, 6.18, it's 81.23 or something. Is that what you guys are signing uh, up for? I think so. 5 o'clock, 8.10 I don't know. Anyway, how do you identify the order of the model? You look at the partial autocorrelations, and you look at the autocorrelations, and different data that's generated by different kinds of processes generate different partial autocorrelations and autocorrelations. How many people ever took uh, physical chemistry in college? Anybody? When they do an MRI, what are they doing? <coughs> they roll you into this great big magnet, right? Yeah. And basically what they're doing is changing the spin states of the electrons in your body. And a given molecule or a given atom is characterized in the steady state by certain spin states. And when you flip the spin states, then it emits a different wavelength radiation. And by interpreting the signals, the wave, the rate changes in the wavelength, they can tell the kind of the density of the tissue. And then they can generate a picture from that. It's not an easy thing to do. So in the bad old days, when in the bad old days when I was a student, uh, in PCAM, we were given an unknown substance, and we had to figure out what it was. And so this is in the very early days of nuclear magnetic resonance. And we would take our little deal of whatever it was over to the magnetic resonance machine, and we would, we would get uh, some computer printout from it that basically told us what the spin state pattern was generated by this unknown substance. And we'd go to a great big book, and we'd look through all the different spin states until we found the one that matched pretty closely what we had, and then we decided that was what was in the deal. Well, partial autocorrelations and autocorrelations work the same way. Autoregressive processes generate partial autocorrelations and autocorrelations with certain patterns, depending on whether it's AR1, AR2, AR3, so on and so forth. If, they, if it's a moving average, you get different kinds of patterns. And so the part of the discussion in ARIMA modeling is to analyze those partial autocorrelations and those autocorrelations to decide what the order, order of the <coughs> autoregressive and moving average parts are. And then subject the results to the hypothesis test. But the point of all that discussion is, of course, that that structure of the error term, the moving average on the error, <coughs> changes this. As we saw when the error term was just that, that's long t plus some fraction of the past period. We got a pattern banded error covariance matrix. And we knew what to do about it then. So this is the non-stochastic part. And this is the stochastic part. So this is a, a violation of this assumption. This is a question of this part of the ARIMA the box canceling process is a discussion about the model specification. So Depending on what I was, the way I chose to chose my notation, I could have written this part as y is equal to x beta, and I could have written this as u. So the reason 518, staff 518, 618 are interesting is because you consider some very common, very special cases. So we've been trying to give an overview of regression analysis and linear models, and 518, 618 allow you to pursue some very specific issues common for certain kinds of data. So nobody's going to tell me on their exam that they're going to, or in their research paper, that they're testing for heteroscedasticity in their time series data. Right? No, that's all I have.